Welcome to Resiliency Radio with me, Dr. Jill, your host. This is your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm your host, and in each episode, we dive deep into the healing and personal transformation, especially as it has to do with complex chronic disease, environmental toxicity, and so many other issues that are becoming, unfortunately, more and more common. Um, join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice. Today is no different. We have an episode with our one of my favorite people in the world, friends, and uh, just an incredible wealth of knowledge about environmental toxicity, Dr. Lynn Patrick. We're going to talk about the surprising effects of pesticide on your health that you may not even be aware of. Dr. Lynn Patrick graduated from Bastyr University in 1984 with a doctorate in naturopathic medicine and has been in private practice in Arizona and Colorado for 35 years. And now we're in the same state, Lynn. <laughs> so exciting. She is a published author of numerous articles in peer-reviewed medical journals, a past contributing editor for Alternative Medicine Review, and recently authored a chapter in the newly released textbook of clinical environmental medicine medicine released in 2019. She speaks all over internationally on environmental medicine, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, endocrine disruption, mental toxicology, sorry, metal, metal toxicology and other topics. And she's currently faculty for the Metabolic Medicine Institute Fellowship in collaboration with George Washington School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She also, we uh, met, I think originally with the Environmental Health Symposium, which you've been doing for years. And it just among physicians, it's one of the best known, respected. And now you're in Southern California. Colorado in our in the same state as me. Um, and you have some fun adventures with kayaking and what else? You uh, hiking, kayaking, biking, all that fun stuff that we both enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome, Lynn. It is so good to have you back. I miss you so much. I just have to say that it's so great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And as always, we're going to have a great conversation. Yes. Well, should we start? Yeah, well, I was just thinking, you know, the last time we had you on, we were um, on a, tri a triad, uh, three of us talking about after the wildfires. And my big aha there was I've seen the labs of patients that had been through the Superior and Louisville, huge wildfire in, let's see, 2000, maybe 22, 21, 21, it was two years ago. And um, just seeing the massive impact on the inflammation in the system, it was looking like mold related illness. So we dove deep into that, but you mentioned before we came on live that there's some new data. Let's talk about wildfires because it's a big deal. So just this month, March of 2024, I just finished my podcast and I reviewed a paper published in the medical scientific literature by some amazing researchers. I mean, Jill, I can't even believe I read this paper. Have you ever seen those papers where like half of them are mathematical equations? Yeah. You know, like, Oh my God, I'll never understand this. So I I just tore it apart and the, the, the entire paper just blew my mind. So these scientists built a house, had a wildfire that blew into the house and then using extremely precise analytical techniques, they figured out where all the VOCs, volatile organic compounds, from that fire ended up. And here is the shocking conclusion of the study. As soon as that fire was out, the main source of VOCs were the VOCs that had been adsorbed, so think Velcro, in the walls, the ceilings, and the floors of the house. Wow. And they off dusted yeah. for weeks and weeks, and they became the main source um, we know those VOCs are not good for our nervous system, our lungs, our gut, none of us. They became that main source. But here's the shocking part. They looked at high-end HEPA filtration, right? So those air filters we all tell our patients to get that are so important, have to, we have to clean our air versus what I call the elbow grease application of washing and vacuuming the walls, the ceiling, and the floors. And guess which intervention was more, significantly more effective at getting rid of those VOCs? I'm guessing the cleaning, right? Elbow grease, right? Wow. So remember, you know, I hear this from our indoor air envi environmental professionals that 
when, and I've heard you talk about this, that when you have a mold exposure event, that mold, the, the nasty parts of the mold, the mycotoxins adhere to the walls, the ceilings and the floors. Well, it's no different with wildfire smoke. Mm -hmm. So they looked at the effectiveness of air filtration to mitigate, yeah. remediate that um, wildfire smoke exposure. And it was virtually, once the smoke yeah. stopped, right? Once the fire was out and the smoke stopped, it was virtually ineffective at getting rid of those VOCs. The only thing that got rid of the VOCs was they literally went in there, these scientists, and they vacuumed the walls, the ceilings, the floors, and they scrubbed them. And, you know, the, I was kind of sitting there with my mouth open reading yeah. this article going, oh boy. I actually decided to name the theme of the podcast, the Humble Pie Podcast, because, you know, that's what we do as scientists, as clinicians, as doctors. We learn and we change our behavior and we change what we tell our patients as a result of the science that comes out. Right. And Ben, that's what I love about you because you are always on the cutting edge. Now I have a story that's going to bring that to light. So interesting. So my office was smack dab in the middle of the superior fires. I was in Hawaii when it happened. And I remember looking back on the maps, I was thousands of miles away and the fires were all over. I literally thought there is no way I'm going to come home to an office. I, I knew it was going to burn down. Well, the divine had protection over that office and it was okay, but it was massively smoke damaged. And again, we didn't understand. Um, and we came back in literally days after the fire, we all got so sick, nauseous headaches, of course, right? It was loaded. We had no water, we had no heat. And we were there trying to see well, how can we mobilize for the community? Like can we donations? And we did some really cool things with companies that were so generous to get stuff to the community, but we're sitting in there and we're all getting sick. And for the first several weeks going back to work, we all had to take turns and shifts because because we would all feel so poorly. No surprise, but get this. So I had a, a, a environmental inspector come in that was an expert in fire and uh, smoke remediation. He looked at everything, gave us an estimate. He brought in hydroxyl machines, which I think are a little safer than ozone for a rehab of the air, but it still didn't help. So we're doing this air quality thing, like you're saying, the oh. machines and, and all that. But here's the deal. I just had this idea. I thought, well, you know, I know how to fix mold. What if we just, and he gave us a quote for some specialty company, like 40 grand, which was more than my insurance policy covered, right? So here's what I did, Lynn, and it worked. I thought, well, I know how to remediate mold. Why don't I try a, a, a oil-based fog and then a deep, deep, deep clean and scrub? And guess what? It was the same thing I would have done if we had mold damage. It worked. It's exactly what you're saying. And I had no idea of this data, but it was like we all felt a million times better. And literally all we did, we did our own elbow grease. We fogged. My staff literally fogged. And then we had not even an expert in environmental remediation, just a good cleaner come in. And we said, we want everything wiped down. All the paper needs to be you know, cleaned and everything. And it was, I would say, 90 to 95% better with all of our symptoms. And that's exactly what we did. And all I took my um, experience was like, well, mold kind of works like this. And it's just those films and VOCs, right? Um, let's try this. So that's fascinating that now the data supports it. Because I still was like, did I do the right thing? But we all felt better, right? And the evidence was in the sequelae that our health issues were improved after we cleaned. And of course, we cleaned the HVAC and there was a lot more to it than just that. But the big mover was cleaning our office just simply. You just proved that same data that the scientists came up with, with their elegant, I mean, th there were pages of uh, mathematical equations for how they figured out mm. the movement, the migration from the air to the surfaces. And I remember, you know, I used to, in a former life, I used to work at a drug and alcohol treatment center treating nicotine addiction. And my job was to run the treatment program, but also to do the education. And I came across this data that showed that, and I, I might get this backwards, but you'll get the idea. Uh, smoke, uh, cigarette smoke particles are electrostatically charged, the opposite of human skin and hair, right? So let's say they're positive and human skin is negative. So there is an electrostatic bond that happens from smoke to human skin. So it's not just that you're breathing the stuff in your lungs. It is literally coating your skin and your hair and wow. your clothing, and it stays there for a long, long time. So mm -hmm. it's the same idea, right? It's just that this is the house 
And this is wildfire smoke instead of, you know, somebody who's puffing on a cigarette. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. And, you so, know, that was my experience with patients in my community too, because I saw a lot of them that were in Louisville that had either their homes and a lot of them, some of them lost their homes, but a lot of them were still in a home that just was massively smoke damaged. And they would come in with migraines and headaches and rashes and really severe symptoms. And the remediators and the people would put in those machines to clear the air, whether it was hydroxyl or just air purifiers. Okay. Um, in the beginning, those hydroxyl ozone, and just to be clear, those are supposed to be run when you're not in the building, but it's supposed to remediate the air. But what you're saying is those things aren't even close to as effective as a good old fashioned, let's get this, this, uh, this. Off. yeah. yeah. Wow. We're learning. We're yeah, learning. exactly. exactly. I just want to mention literally this week, I just shared this with you. Neither one of us have read the full article, but just this week in JAMA, as we are recording, and I'll link this, it's uh, an article in JAMA, which is a major medical journal called Wildfire Smoke and its Neurological Impact. So we'll have to have another part two on that specific topic. No um, kidding. We'll have to do another one. Yeah. Go ahead. We're here to, do you want to talk about pesticides? Yes. Yes. I wanted that one to dive in and everybody knows I grew up on a farm and I feel like, you know, uh, unbeknownst to me, those pesticides, the um, at atrazine and the glyphosate and all these things. And I wanted to broaden it. We we're going to talk about glyphosate. Maybe we start there, but I want to broaden it because there's okay. so many other pesticides yes. that are affecting. I have, I have just done two podcasts on breaking really crucial um pesticide debacle. So we'll end there, but we'll start with glyphosate. Perfect. So I did a podcast on all of the glyphosate data, looking at this question, which I know you and I are really interested in. If you change your diet to 100% organic, does your urinary glyphosate, which is how we measure it in the urine, does it go away? Sadly, no. It doesn't. Now, this was a study that came out done by one of my favorite researchers, Dr. Cynthia Curl in Idaho, who did the original data. Remember those studies that showed that when kids were taken off of conventional um, food and put on organic diets, their levels of two organophosphate, which are the ones that are most commonly used now, <clears throat> pesticides in their urine went down almost to non-detectable within 48 hours. I mean, it was immediate. And then they, of course, put those kids back on conventional diets and they measured those uh, chlorpyrifos and malathion, the two that they measured, the levels came back up within 48 hours. So this was, she was the first person to do this research in the United States. We were all like, oh my gosh, this is great. Works. <laughs> yeah. Just in 2023, she did a follow-up study on... Um, pregnant women looking at a, a change in their diet. So they gave them 100% uh, organic food, and then they switched them back to a conventional diet. But she did something different. She identified where they lived. Did they live within a third of a mile of an agricultural area? Now, this was, I think, uh, South, I hope I get this right, South eastern Idaho versus southwestern Idaho and she does her research so she plotted out exactly where they lived and yes there is glyphosate sprayed in that part of Idaho plus the drift from eastern Washington comes right over the mountains there so here's what they found if they lived further away than a third of a mile 
they had a significant drop in their urinary glyphosate levels. If those women lived within a third of a mile of an agricultural area, they did not have a drop in their glyphosate levels. Now, I'm going to lead into the conversation we both want to have. What do we do about that, right? And I live in a small town, 3,500 people down the alley from me is a huge alfalfa field. And as you know, Roundup Ready Alfalfa is GMO alfalfa, right? It's, um, it is alfalfa that, it, that you spray with Roundup and then it is, you know, a, it kills all the, the weeds. It and survives weeds. and everything else dies, right? Yeah. So I measured my urinary glyphosate levels. I know you have because I've seen the results and we have, we've got it. Yes. It's enough. So that led me to all the other studies that have been done in humans looking at glyphosate levels. And what all of that research in a group of menopausal women, in a group of postgraduate young students, all of that put together, what it shows us is that there are other sources of glyphosate besides organic versus non-organic food. Now, of course, the highest levels of glyphosate, the winner of all the food that's ever been tested, um, in, and I'm going to include alcohol here, the highest level of glyphosate that's ever been documented in a food. Do you know what it is? What food I'm talking about? Whole foods, conventionally grown hummus. Oh. Weighing in at 2,000. 379 parts per billion of glyphosate. That's extremely high. Why is that? Because um, Bayer, the company that now makes glyphosate, <clears throat> teaches farmers that if you don't want your grains or your legumes to go bad in the field once they've been harvested, you go through that field and you marinate them in glyphosate, right? So it's post-harvest desiccation is what it's called. So unfortunately, those, for some reason, those beans, those garbanzo beans get marinated and they turn out to be the most highly contaminated. So that was a source. And, and you know, to be clear, when this article came out, Cynthia Curl's article that shows that if you live within a third of a mile of an agricultural field, you can't get your glyphosate urinary levels down. They did go back and ask these women, you know, were you 100% compliant? Yeah. And the ones that said, well, you know, my husband brought me some takeout, you know, right. or Middle Eastern food or something. Um, when they took those women out of the study, there was a significant difference. Okay. So there was some contamination, right? It's it's hard when you've got people in a study yeah. and you don't sequester them off in a room to get them to, you know, to just eat organic food. The other thing, and this came from the postmenopausal women's study, is that when they went back and they asked the women uh, in whom they had measured urinary glyphosate, did you have any wine? The yeah. ones who said, oh, yeah, I did have wine. And they took those women out, then same thing, right? That that so we we don't think about, and I know my patients don't think about that wine has glyphosate in it. And in fact, it has a lot of glyphosate. Um, the winner for the glyphosate in wine contest, according to consumer reports, so this is all published. Yeah. I'm not saying anything that isn't in the scientific literature, was Sutter Home white wine at 51 parts per billion of glyphosate. So that's a significant source of glyphosate, but so is back to nature granola, Quaker oats granola, you know, oats Quaker are- Quaker oats was the one I was going to say when you first asked me, because I've heard the studies on the residue on oats and the conventionally grown oats, but I did not know that hummus, um, but makes sense. And some of these things I'm assuming as we, I mean, we use some of these root vegetables to rehab soil. So it's probably to my thought is maybe the legumes kind of family is even more absorptive. Ooh, for soil. That's right. a really interesting point, right? Is do these plants sequester yes. glyphosate from the soil? That's I don't a know. Just curious. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Huber, right? Yeah. The yes. Yes. I need to get <laughs> Huber for that. Yeah. So. 
this all le- all of this led me to look at all the research about how do we get glyphosate out of our bodies. And I came across some very surprising information. In the kind of, you know, the the common um, vernacular, what we're told, what we read on the internet is that 20% of glyphosate is absorbable, right? So we we eat something, 20% of it ends up in our bloodstream. But all of that, came from animal research. And when you look at human research, which is there where they have humans, real life humans, and they give them, which it's legal to do, believe it or not, a certain amount of glyphosate. (laughs) So they know how much they gave them between one and 6% of that glyphosate ends up in their urine. So what happens to the rest of that glyphosate? Well, these are living humans. They can't take a little piece of liver tissue or kidney tissue. Um, And surprisingly, they didn't look in the stool. But we have to assume that the rest of it ends up in the stool. So it goes through the intestinal tract and ends up in the stool, you know, ends up in the bowel movements of the humans. So what we know from some of the research that's been done on the microbiome is that glyphosate is significantly toxic to the microbiome. And scientists that have looked at the entire microbiome, and I'm talking about the microbiome of the armpit, the private parts, the mouth, the throat, the, you know, we have a, our microbiome varies so much from place to place. The skin, that over half of that entire microbiome is potentially damaged by glyphosate because those bugs, those wonderful bacteria that help keep our skin in a certain pH and help keep our our intestinal tract healthy are susceptible or killed by glyphosate. So this is a serious problem, but most- I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say, I remember but, being shocked by the research because what they did, Monsanto, when they first came out, said, let's check it in human cells. And they didn't see a significant issue. But what you're describing is the thing they ignored and they knew. And it's a massive bomb to the microbiome because it chelates the minerals that are essential for healthy things like lactobacillus. Exactly. And bifidobacteria. Oh, yes. Very bad for bifidobacteria. So we've got this serious toxin. And I do mean serious because at point one, remember, do you remember your levels of glyphosate in your urine? Oh, Mine were point three parts per billion. Gosh, I'm going to be able to pull that up while you're talking, but yeah, it was, mine was really, uh, the very first one I did was that first one that was no longer available, but it was comparing to farmers on application day. I was three times the level uh, of farmers on application day. So whatever that would be, it was the shocking. So rural, rural really Americans. Quick, that, that level was with me hundred percent organic. So again, there was dogs that walked on lawns that slept in my bed. Like there's other factors, but I was one of those N of ones that literally was so fastidious on my diet. And this was probably now eight or 10 years ago, but mm. it, it uh, proves your point that I was getting exposures that weren't probably for my diet. So I was 0.3 parts mm-hmm. per billion in my urine. So three times the level I'm referring to. Okay. So 0.1 parts per billion. That's the level that Dr. Gilles-Éric Serolini, the famous French scientist, found was toxic in his rat population. Remember, he did that study where he looked at the entire lifespan of rats. Yes. The ones that he fed uh, glyphosate from corn all of the female rats got breast tumors and all of the male rats developed liver tumors. That was a 0.1 parts per billion. Okay. So now we know that rural Americans in that study, their levels of glyphosate were as high as 3.3 parts per billion. So 30 times that high, right? And in the NHANES database, you know, the big pop 4,700 people that the CDC measures the median was about one and a half to, it was about one and a half parts per billion. So that's what Americans are walking around with in their urine. So all of this 
got me really curious about what are we going to do about this, right? If it's true that we're exposed to this, and even you and I, who are, you know, probably equally fastidious about <clears throat> eating organic, and I don't even drink, so I'm, you know, me the neither. That's the thing. There's no wine or beer in there either. <laughs> no wine or beer. Yeah. Um, and definitely no whole foods hummus. Yeah. But I, you know, I live down the alley from that that um, Roundup Ready alfalfa field. I started really thinking about: Can we detoxify glyphosate? Is it possible? And I started getting messages in my inbox about detoxify glyphosate now. So I looked at those and it was, you know, I just, I love science. I was trained by this guy named Jeffrey Bland before I ever went to medical school. I, I fell head over heels in love with science. And I'm afraid that that concept of critical thinking that we adhere to so closely we may have lost it because what these uh, product manufacturers were saying is, look, we have six people. They had this level of glyphosate in their urine. We gave them this magic product and then we checked them again and they have no, they had no glyphosate in their urine. And I thought, mm -hmm. shouldn't we have more? Mm -hmm. If you're trying to get the glyphosate out of their body, shouldn't their urine levels go up? Isn't that what you want? Right. So I contacted them, you know, hi, just me checking in. I think what you're saying is you may have found a way to push glyphosate into, you know, further storage inside the body. I mean, what are you doing? Right, right. I never heard back from any of them. Obviously, they weren't really interested in my my comments. This is what I love about you, Lynn. Even in our boards, and so many <laughs> things were on similar. I, I love because you often see Lynn Patrick's comments and they're always like, have we thought about this? And here's some evidence for this. And I just, I love and adore you for that because you really bring the science to Thank that. You. Thank okay. you. So what I realized from that study with the humans mm -hmm. that showed that only between 1% and 6% of the glyphosate comes out in the urine. And then Dr. Zach Bush, I don't know if you know him, but kind of brainy guy. He did a study looking at the effect of glyphosate on the mucosal layer in the intestines, showing that it does in fact destroy the mucus layer. And you know, for those of you that aren't into the mucus layer in the intestines, I know it sounds gross, but it's critical because the majority of the microbiome lives there, right? We think that the microbiome's floating around in the intestinal tract, but no, it's not. It lives in this beautiful little layer on the right on the kind of the border of the tissue, the, mu the mucosa of the intestines, because there's so much good food for the microbiome there, right? And if you're eating a biocide that destroys that, that's really going to wreak havoc with your intestines. So I thought, is, it, is there any evidence that having a good digestive tract functional rate of elimination decreases the toxicity of glyphosate or at least decrease, decreases the amount that's absorbed. And there is some data for people who eat six servings of veggies a day, they do have lower levels of glyphosate in their urine, so they're absorbing less. And I did talk to, do you know Dr. Russell Jaffe? Yeah. He's a senior research fellow at NIH, right? Brilliant guy. And he said, absolutely the bowel transit time. So that's the time from when you eat something, put it in your mouth until it comes out the other end. Uh, if we optimize that, so 14 to 18 hours is the optimal, right? The average in America, I think is, you're not going to like what I'm about to say, but it's like 96 hours. Right. Even if you have normal bowel movements, right? Mm -hmm. It's that long for food to get through your gut. And just to be clear, so people are listening, the reason is we absorb 95% of toxins and bile and things in the bowel. And if the longer it's there, the more we just reabsorb this toxic load, right? Exactly. So we don't want things to go through too fast. We don't want to get diarrhea, but 14 to 18 hours, normal stools, that's going to decrease the time that glyphosate stays in the intestinal tract. And if it's true from the little research that we have that 94 to 
of the glyphosate we're exposed to comes out through our intestinal tract, that would be helpful. Yes. So there, the purveyors of specific types of fibers that are supposedly magic at detoxifying glyphosate really don't have anything over just fiber, you know, regular fiber that we get from, oh, whole food, vegetables and fruit. And so I would, you know, I of course would love to have millions of dollars and do the research correctly. But so far, I think that that appears to be from all the research I could find that was published, the best application to minimize the effect that glyphosate has on our bodies. Now, yeah, people forget about alcohol. People forget, I mean, wine is wine, right? So people forget that wine that's non-organic has glyphosate in it. And there's lots of studies. Well, there's two good studies that I reviewed in the podcast, one from Europe, one from the United States that Consumer Reports did showing significant amounts of glyphosate in wine. I have a friend who lives in wine country and she goes, oh yeah, you know, all the conventional vineyards spray glyphosate because they don't want weeds growing, you know, between the grape plants. I don't know why. I mean, I think grapes would be fine, but that's kind of the standard for vinic, what's it called? Viniculture, whatever, for growing grapes. Um, and the other, of course, is water, drinking water. Yes. Some municipalities, I did a deep dive into this. Some municipalities can get the glyphosate out of water and some can't. So right. there's documented evidence of contamination of drinking water with glyphosate. Wow. Um, Environmental Working Group has taken that out of the EPA data. And there's published studies in the scientific literature that shows, yes, considerable amounts. Now, the good news is it's easy peasy to get glyphosate out of drinking water. You just need activated charcoal. So even those very, very economical pour through filter systems yeah. will do it. Wonderful. You know, the little activated charcoal filters, you of course have to change them on a regular basis, but they will do it. Now, the one study I found that shows that you can actually bind something in the intestinal tract. I forgot to talk about this, so I'm kind of backtracking. Okay. To glyphosate is clay. They actually did studies in. That's what I was going to ask: is charcoal oh, clay and pectisol or, or, or citrus? Mon more yeah, monmortalite clay, and they actually saw in vitro that the clay bound to the glyphosate, and it was a significant binding, meaning it just wasn't momentary. It was a, a binding that then lasted uh, for hours. But here's the thing best at a pH of two, mm. very weak at a pH of seven. And we know that the only place there's a pH of two in the human body is in the stomach. Yes. Right? Right. So we can assume that if we took clay with our food, right. it would bind to the glyphosate. The downside of that is that clay also interferes with mineral absorption. So we don't want to do that for a long period of time because that would not be good for our mineral, uh, the mineral absorption for the minerals that we need. But at least, you know, we know that clay does have the capacity to do that. Now, there was not any good research that I could find for activated charcoal in the intestinal tract, right? In a human or a mm -hmm. animal body. Um, so maybe yeah. that would happen, but we don't have any evidence for that. So we have to do the very best that we can because glyphosate is very toxic to the human microbiome. And the, the study that I looked at, looked at every separate part of the microbiome and every single one, Jill, was at least 40% of that microbiome was susceptible to glyphosate. I mean, that's so the vascular microbiome. Okay. And, and think about the babies that are given formula. That's the not, I mean, to, to me, that's the bigger tragedy is these small, you know, size relative to adults that are giving formula that we know is the you know, conventional soy or um, any thoughts on that? Or, uh, I mean, obviously mothers, if they have a choice of organic formulas, but um, that's a big deal. Well, I have to say 
because I always have to say this because I talk about toxicants that are found in the breast milk. Yes. Breast is always best. Yes. I don't even care if it's a situation like um, in the Arctic where, you know, toxins migrate northward towards the North Pole, where uh, Inuit women have very high levels of PCBs in their breast milk. I still think breast milk is good because it's got its own microbiome, right? You can't get it in anywhere else. It's not in formula. So yeah, breast is best. And then an organic, if you have to use a formula, an organic, a USDA organic formula, even soy is going to be much better than a conventional formula. Excellent. But yeah. I And the, the simplest, most affordable pour through picture filtration, you know, they're called pitchers you know, yeah. because they are literally, and they're, they're now making glass ones, which I'm very happy to see. Me too, because otherwise there's the plastic ones that are a dime a dozen and it's nice to have the glass. Um, yes, the glass question, did you come across a lot of companies that make humic and fulvic acids or claiming that they detoxify glyphosate? Any evidence on that? Or um... so The one study I found was a study that Dr. Bush did, Zach Bush, but it was in an in vitro model. Okay. Now, it was a brilliant in vitro model where they actually, so the in vitro just means it wasn't in a living being, right? It was in the laboratory. They tried to create kind of a synthetic intestinal lining, which I wish I had seen that, but I just had to read about it. And this was actually a published study. And what they found was that the glyphosate actually did attack that mucin layer. And that by using humate fulvate, which is, you know, it's dirt. Yeah. I mean, there are acids <laughs> that are found in dirt. They were able to minimize that damage. But that, I have to say, that's in a plastic model, you know, in a non-living scenario, which is very different than in a living scenario where you're actually using an animal, you know, a rat or a mouse or something, um, where you can actually look at what's going on biologically. Um, I would love for them to do that in an animal so that we can see what it really looks like in an animal. So the best thing is trying to avoid, but we can't, like you said, with the uh, spraying off. And I think I read a study, this has been a few years now, that there were traces found in organic California wine. So again, that that airflow, um, the, the breeze that takes it other places. Let's shift to pesticides in general, because that is another huge, huge thing. And there's so many we could talk about. What are the top ones of your concern and uh, what do we do about it? Okay. Uh, boy, I know. Let's <laughs> okay. so I have to talk about the breaking news because this is so important. So we started in the seventies, replacing the Rachel Carson organochlorine pesticides with organophosphate pesticides because they were supposedly safe and effective and harmless, right? Which we know now absolutely is not true. One of those pesticides is called chlorpyrifos. Of all of the organophosphate pesticides, let's just call chlorpyrifos the poster child because we have more evidence for neurological damage in both developing fetuses and in young children for chlorpyrifos than any other pesticide. 10 years ago, the EPA started trying to phase out chlorpyrifos. It took until 2021 for them to actually be able to take it off the market. Now, I got something in 2023 across my inbox that said, chlorpyrifos is coming back. And I thought, oh no, what the pesticide companies are doing, which is unfortunately the way the game is played is they're suing the EPA to get registration, which is the legal thing you have to have for a pesticide to use it. You have to have legal registration to get that legal registration back. And in fact, they got so dirty, they actually sued the head of the EPA personally, Andrew Wheeler. They sued him for everything he owned. <laughs> this is what actually happened. This is not a secret. It's everywhere. So this happened in 2023. And I don't know who got to the judge, but the Eighth Circuit Court actually potentially reversed the ban. Now, some things have to happen, but if 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 things proceed 
as they are scheduled, chlorpyrifos will come back. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely the most neurologically damaging pesticide that's ever been proven to be neurologically damaging, wow. right? And it is heavily used. Half of all the apples uh -huh. in the country that are conventionally grown have chlorpyrifos residue on them, right? So flip a coin, whether your conventionally grown apple is going to give you a little dose of chlorpyrifos when you eat it. Uh, green vegetables like kale also. So it's used widely. It's used on grains. It's used on sugar beets. So it's in sugar. Uh, and yes, chlorpyrifos residues are measured in conventionally grown food. So we have to prevent that from happening. And so there is a, a way that citizens and consumers can actually directly work with either Pesticide Action Network, my favorite organization, um, or Organic Consumers, another wonderful organization that is actively working to lobby mm -hmm. the Environmental Protection Agency and all of our Congress people not to let this happen. So that's chlorpyrifos. The only way to avoid chlorpyrifos is to eat USDA organic food. Now there's this thing called, I'm sure everybody here is aware of it, the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15 to Environmental Working Group. That information is the FDA database for contam the most heavily contaminated fruits and vegetables. But what they do not test for, and everybody needs to know this, is they don't test dairy products or meat, and they don't test um, many uh, processed foods. You know, they're only talking about fresh fruits and vegetables. They don't test one of the most highly contaminated with pesticides foods in America, which is wheat. Wheat is highly contaminated by some of the most toxic pesticides. Yeah. And Dr. Cynthia Curl, who I mentioned before, she actually did that research. She looked into the EPA database because there's a 6,000 fold difference in the toxicity of pesticides. And she looked at the most highly toxic ones what foods are those pesticides used on? The Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15 does not use that method, that methodology. What she found is wheat, brassica, and uh, some other grains like corn are the most contaminated with the most contaminated pesticides, the most toxic pesticides, sorry. And so we, we have to really kind of create a hierarchy yeah. because... It is, as you know, it is challenging to eat 100% organic. It's, yeah, and you really can't eat out at all because there's no, I don't know if even in Boulder, it's rare that you find an all organic restaurant. That's just almost unheard of. It's supposed to do with the oils and things that they use and the seeds and all that. Um, so fascinating. One thought too, I've always wondered the, the fad of autoimmune paleo diets and paleo diets, they eliminate grains and legumes. And in my mind, those are number one, very highly contaminated with mycotoxins, but also pesticides. And I always wonder if some of the improvement isn't just because eliminating some of the big sources of, um, you know, pesticides, but also mycotoxins. I think about that all the time. And that's one of the problems with our way of, of, our industrial agriculture, right, is that it sterilizes the soil and makes it easier for my molds and mycotoxins to actually grow into the plant. Yeah. They don't just up to grab onto the root. They actually are found in the plant. You know, the, the grains that are conventionally grown are higher in mold residue and mycotoxins than grains that are organically grown. So I think that hierarchy that we're constructing right now is that if we want to put stuff at the top, the do not eat list, it's not just the dirty uh, dozen and the clean 15. It's grains, specifically wheat. And that's from Dr. Curl's research. And I have to talk a little bit about conventionally grown brassica. So those are cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kale, watercress broccoli sprouts, broccoli, all those wonderful foods that are so good for us. 
they also happen, if they're conventionally grown, to be contaminated with some of the more toxic pesticides. So for instance, if you go to Whole Foods and you get a smoothie, you're not going to get any organic fruit and vegetables in and that. And you're smoothie. getting a high concentration. I've seen some of the most toxic thallium levels in the people who drink green drinks all the time, right? <laughs> I, I just was going to tell you about a case of a man who had significant neurologic problems, you know, brain fog, fatigue, paresthesias, he had numbness and tingling. And uh, his doctor thought mistakenly he had metal poisoning, went through a year of chelation therapy, he did not get better. And then he went to see my mentor, Dr. Walter Crinian, who did a thorough intake on him and found out he would had been going to Whole Foods every morning to get a great big, you know, 32 ounce green smoothie, and that his organophosphate pesticide urine levels were through the roof as a result. So we have to think about, you know, where is our food coming from? And can we think that foods that are supposed to be good for us, like brassicas or smoothies, are they really good for us? Not if they're made from conventionally grown fruits and vegetables. Sources. Right. One more thing I have yeah. to talk about, because I did my podcast on that this month. The Environmental Working Group, God bless those people, are just published two studies. One of them was that they looked in conventional cereals for a contaminant. It's called a pesticide, but it's really not, called chlormaquat. So chlor, like chlorine, me, quat. Quat stands for quaternary ammonium compound, a toxic additive to personal care products. This is a growth regulator. It's not a pesticide. And it's used uh, extensively in Canada to mm -hmm. grow oats. And Quaker, as, uh, in addition to other oat manufacturers, uses oats from Canada. And so Environmental Working Group looked in those Quaker products for levels of chlormaquat. Now, EWG did a lot of research looking at what's a, an acceptable level. And they figured out it was 30 parts per billion. You know, above that, it's going to do damage. And this is a endocrine disruptor par excellence, right? It's a growth regulator that alters plant hormones, right? Because if you have a beautiful, lustrous, great big stalk of oats and it falls over, it's harder to harvest. So these growth regulators are used to create these little stumpy stalks of oats that are easier. They don't fall over. They're easier to harvest. So they found in Quaker oatmeal, 300 parts per billion of chlormaquat. The EPA doesn't regulate chlormaquat. I don't know why. It's a problem, right? So then they looked in the urine of people in the United States of America. They actually got access to several different studies where they were collecting human urine. In 2017, about 60... 5% of the urine of these patients had chlormaquat in it. It's up to over 90% wow. now in 2023. Wow. They looked from 20, uh, 2017 to 2023, and they found not only more people, but the levels of chl chlormaquat in the urine will also go in it. Now, the problem with chlormaquat is that in the animal studies, you're looking at decreased levels of testosterone, mm -hmm. altered thyroid hormone, uh, deformities in the womb regarding the development of the skeleton. So skeletal deformities, lower birth weight, lower birth length. So babies are being born not only small for their gestational developmental age, but also shorter. None of that is good. No. That's all bad. Wow. And so the now remember, chlormaquat is outlawed in the United States so far, but in 2018 and just recently in 2020, the company that makes chlormaquat successfully lobbied the EPA for allowing higher levels of contamination for imported oats. Right. And in I think uh, 2020. 
2021 or 2022, I can't remember, they formally asked the EPA for registration, meaning we want to bring chlorinoquat into the United States. So the EWG doing a beautifully crafted strategic preemptive strike published this data just last month. Oh, good. Both in the humans mm -hmm. and they did a little, which is on their website, ewg.org. They did. They uh, looked at about 14 different cereals. Now, organic granola, the one they tested, had no chlormaquat in it, no detectable chlormaquat. Uh, there was one commercial cereal that had no detectable chlormaquat, but the other 13 had significant levels of chlormaquat in the cereal box, right? So in the Quaker Oats box, you know, good old Quaker Oats, or the actual cereal, you know, the granola, Quaker's granola. So that's the other one that I think has to be avoided because it's such a an obviously strong endocrine disruptor. You know, we know there are endocrine disruptors in our environment, but this is an obvious one. This is a no-brainer. And we'll be sure if you're listening to link up some of the places where you can be an advocate or a political voice, some of the, the websites you already gave us, Lynn, and I'll make sure and list all those wherever you're watching this. Because if you have a voice and have a say, I think the more um, of all of us that can get together and really um, talk about the toxicity and why we don't want that in our food supply, the better. Yes. Right now, Environmental Working Group, if you just go to their website and you type chlor -me, M E quat into the search engine, they've got a whole Perfect. bunch of pages on chlormaquat and how to take action. They make it very easy. It will take you no more than a couple of minutes. I'll to link to that for sure. So our last bit here, this is overwhelming and really, really important information. Um, we're all swimming in toxic soup. What would be your takeaway for someone who's, you know, maybe just a mom trying to feed her kids or what would be a few very practical, maybe somewhat affordable things that we can do to actually decrease our toxic load? Well, I have a million as you probably, <laughs> right? No, no. but I have to say, yeah. Uh, our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Michelle Perro, who's a board certified pediatrician, commissioned a study to look at the actual question, is it more expensive to eat an organic diet? And she compared a standard American diet, the cost of going to the grocery store and buying the standard American diet items versus a whole foods, meaning fruits, fruits vegetables, fresh you know, cooking up organic oatmeal, um, not having a lot of processed foods, organic diet, and guess what? The same price. So no longer can we say, oh, God, you know, I'm a single mom. I have four kids. Yeah. I can't afford, you know, to do that. Actually, you can. And that, Dr. Perro has an entire book of stories about what happened in her practice when her families, not just the kids, yeah. but her families went on an all organic diet, reversed uh, kidney failure. I mean, I could go Crohn's disease. I could go on and on, but it's worth it. Yeah. The amount of money that we spend on our health uh, failing yeah. is so much more than what, you know, we can invest in a whole foods organic diet. Uh, the other thing is, um, Oh boy. Um, my favorite sweating. Yes. Sweating a very effective way to get out a lot of toxins, including uh, organochlorine pesticide, huh? which is held in our tissues. We kind of hang on to those in our fat. And you don't even, you know, I've helped folks who didn't even have money to buy a sauna or to get a pass to the gym to go to the sauna, sweat. You yeah. go in your bathroom, you put a towel under the door, mm -hmm. you turn the heater on, voila, yeah. instant sauna. You can sweat. So sweating for 20 minutes a day, followed by a really good soapy shower to get all of those fat-soluble toxins off your skin is wonderful. Um, I am lucky enough to have a sauna in my house, and I also have a cold plunge. And going from that 150-degree heat to that 40-degree cold, it's absolutely life-changing, I have to say. Um, the other thing is the simple, inexpensive, life-saving, 
nutrients that we can take that cost pennies a day, like N-acetylcysteine, pretty much everybody, unless you have an active peptic ulcer, you can take it, uh, is there are right now, I think about 30,000 articles in PubMed on N-acetylcysteine and both animals and humans. It's unbelievable the uh, ability of N-acetylcysteine to help the body detoxify. Vitamin C, mm -hmm. vitamin E, magnesium, all of those basic nutrients are so crucial in helping uh, basically create an optimal situation in terms of liver function and kidney function. And that's where we detoxify and then bowel function, right? Making sure you're getting that fiber as we started out with just practically from food if possible, or you can add psyllium or chia or flax or some of these wonderful. Um, yeah. Line them up, put them on your cereal, cost pennies a day. Mm -hmm. You know, do you remember they did this wonderful study in um, Scandinavian, one of the Scandinavian countries where they divided, a, it was a prospective study where the divided group of women in half gave half of them the equivalent of two tablespoons of ground flaxseed a day. They followed them for six months. Then, you know, they said, okay, stop. Then they followed them for several years. The group that took the flaxseed had half the incidence of breast cancer, wow. just from that simple intervention of fiber, mm -hmm. flaxseed fiber, right? But fiber. And simple, like you said, so much of what you shared is very, practical. It doesn't have to be extremely expensive and it's uh, approachable to pretty much anyone, even with a family or a smaller budget. Oh, Lynn, we could go on and on and on. This has been so chock full of great information, practical information. And I know people are going to appreciate this. Where can they find you more about you? You're, you've got a training coming up, I think. Sure. So uh, what I do, I used to be a clinician, had a practice for many, many years. Now I spend every waking moment of my life doing podcasts and also training physicians in environmental medicine. Okay. So I have a training platform called EMEI. It stands for Environmental Medicine Education International. And we'll put the link to the website in the show notes, emei.org. We did, Dr. Jill, I have to tell you this, we did do a course after East Palestine. I got so angry about the lack of any public health help for those people that we did a whole course that we're rewriting now. And that will be for the public on how the basics yeah. for self-care, water, air filtration and supplements and what to do if you have a chemical disaster like East Palestine, um, you know, just basic public health information that should have been available to those folks that was not made available to them. Awesome. Thank you for your amazing work in the world. We will link to the um, website and all the notes that we talked about today. Um, Lynn, you are a treasure. Thank you again for all that you do for all. Dr. C. Well, that's a wrap with Dr. Lynn Patrick and everything you wanted to know about pesticide exposure and how to decrease your risk. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode of Resiliency Radio. You know you can find all episodes on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you watch or listen to podcasts. Won't you please stop by and leave a review so we can reach more people. Uh, be sure and tune in as I put out a new episode every week. And if you want to look at transcripts or any more information, you can go to my website, jillcarnahan.com, where you'll find all the transcripts and all of the episodes that have been produced. Be sure and like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you can be notified of the next subscription. Thanks so much and have a great evening.